I'm gonna tell you all my camera settings for every scenario, so brace yourself. This is a lot of information. If you feel like you don't know what your camera setting should be in any situation, switch your camera into the green auto mode or the P mode. There's something photographers don't talk about much, which is information overload. We can only handle so much in any one scene. If you feel like you can't handle your composition and checking the edges of the frame and choosing the right background and posing the fingers of a model and making sure that there aren't weird flyaways or smudge makeup, if you can't handle all of that and deal with your shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, then go full auto. You're better off narrowing down the number of things you need to concentrate on. Practice getting your settings right when it doesn't count. Just go out and casually shoot and make sure you can nail the settings. When it does count, again, if you're not confident, go into auto mode, because I know too many photographers who are overthinking, is this the right aperture, ISO, and all that, and they end up ruining the exposure on an important shot. Wait until you're comfortable. Okay, so first, on my day-to-day -day shooting, I'm in aperture priority mode with the lens's lowest f-stop, whatever that lens is. Typically, that lets in the most light, and it will blur the background as much as possible, and then when I'm just carrying the camera around, I don't know what the situation is gonna be. That's what I want more times than not. I'm also using auto ISO, so the camera can completely adjust the exposure, and I'm just trusting the auto exposure system. But in my mind, I'm thinking, do I have enough depth of field? Whenever I pick the camera up, I'm thinking, are there other things in the frame that I wanna make sure are in focus? And over the years of shooting with different cameras and lenses, I have developed a sense for how much acceptable depth of field I'm going to get. There's no one right answer that I can give you because it's gonna depend on the lens and the body that you're using. It's also gonna depend on the megapixels of the camera because a high megapixel camera, any, anything that's out of focus is gonna be that much more obvious. That it will also be more obvious if you're using a really sharp lens or if you plan on making really big prints. If I'm shooting something just for Instagram, it's a really small format. So if somebody's a little bit out of focus, I know it doesn't matter. There's no f-stop that I can tell you that's going to work for you. Over the years of shooting and experimenting, you will develop a sense for what works for your specific situation, for your specific zooms, for your specific distances to the subject, and how far apart different subjects are. I hope you can understand that copying settings from somebody else won't work for you because there are so many variables. And it's not something you can study and memorize and learn. It's something you have to just experience and get a feel for. But that feeling will come with enough time. Here's an example. I often shoot portraits at 200 millimeters and f2.8 on a full frame body. And I know for a headshot, that's great. I can just focus on the nearest eye and it should be fine. But if a second person comes in the scene, I know that I need to be at probably f5.6 or f8 with something like a 5D Mark III. But if I step up to a higher resolution body like this D850 and I'm planning on a bigger print, then I know I need to be more like f11 or f16 because that depth of field is going to fall off really, really quickly. I also know that it depends on the subjects too. If they're two little kids and they're always going to be moving around and I have to grab the snapshot quickly, I'm going to go for a higher f-stop just to improve my chances. If it's two models and I can carefully pose them, then I might be able to get their faces more perfectly aligned and use a lower f-stop. I hope you can see it's a process, a, f a feeling that I've developed for my particular gear and the situations that I tend to shoot. It varies so much with subject and distance that there's no copying it. It's something that I just had to learn with experience. And if you're not sure, you take a picture, you review it, you zoom in really closely, and then you make adjustments from there. If there's not enough depth of field, use a higher f-stop number. But generally, you can always start out at the lowest f-stop number. Now, even though I'm shooting an aperture priority with auto ISO, I'm keeping an eye on the shutter speed that the camera is choosing. Because if that shutter speed gets too low, either I might get motion blur from the subject moving, or I might get camera shake from the way I'm holding the camera. And that's a whole other thing entirely. I know if I'm shooting it at 200 millimeters and f2.8 on, say, a 5D Mark III, um, for portraits, I'm usually good if I'm at 1 60th or 1 100th. The way I handhold with my particular biology, I tend to be okay at those shutter speed shooting people, unless they're kids. Kids move around more, they're just a little twitchier, so I'd have to use a higher shutter speed. Uh, if I'm shooting with like a 50 megapixel 5 DSR or this D850, uh, that resolution is gonna show both camera shake and natural human motion blur more. So I'm gonna have to choose a higher shutter speed. And with those cameras, I'd probably jump all the way up to like 1 250th, 
one three twentieth to be sure that it got sharp pictures. It also depends on the subject. If it's a professional model, they will pose and freeze and pose and freeze. And the reason they do that is they're freezing to give you sharper pictures by eliminating motion blur. But most people aren't professional models. Most people are just a portrait client and they just kind of pose by like moving smooth and fluidly. And that means I actually need to use a higher shutter speed to freeze their motion. It also depends on whether or not I have an image stabilized lens. Like sometimes we'll shoot with an unstabilized uh, 85 millimeter f1.8. Uh, I know that I have to keep the shutter speed higher. The reciprocal rule doesn't necessarily apply anymore, but for that I might be at 1 200th pretty much all the time just to make sure that I eliminate camera shake. Maybe I use a, a monopod or something depending on the situation if I really want to get down lower and use a lower ISO. Okay, back up. If I notice that my shutter speed is getting too slow to give me sharp pictures, I'll switch from aperture priority to manual mode. Manual mode lets me specify both the aperture and the shutter speed. Though I'm in manual mode, I will continue to use auto ISO. All modern cameras support auto ISO, the old ones didn't, so that's like a huge benefit. So I'm still getting to use auto exposure, which means the whole process is much faster and I can have the camera automatically adapt to changing conditions. This is key, some people will meter the situation and then lock in the aperture shutter speed and ISO and just leave it there. Uh, that can work, but in my experience that's going to leave you with some pictures that are, can be under or overexposed because, well, the sun is constantly moving if you're outside. Even the difference of uh, 15 minutes can mean a third of a stop of exposure. A cloud could move in front of the sun and drop the exposure by a stop or two. And if you're in all manual with manual ISO, then you have to be thinking about all that. And for me, for the way I work, I'd rather just let the camera think about that stuff. So it's one less thing for me to think about. I'm also keeping an eye on the histogram to make sure the camera's auto exposure system isn't under or overexposing things. Like I said, in my experience, it does a better job of adapting to changing situations than I do, but I've developed a sense for specific scenarios where it's going to fail me. Like the Canon cameras in heavily backlit situations, they tend to underexpose it. So if I'm shooting a portrait with backlighting, which I love to do, I will add a stop of exposure compensation. The 5DSR for some reason in particular seems to really, really underexpose. So I might have to add a stop and a half or even two stops of exposure compensation. With my mirrorless cameras like this Fuji here, I you can use the viewfinder and get a real time histogram. So I can just adjust it before I shoot. With SLRs like this, I have to shoot and then review the picture, make adjustments, and then reshoot. So getting those exposures right is one of the reasons that I like to have an electronic viewfinder on my camera. I also wanna make the point, like you can't say always dial in one stop of exposure uh, compensation in this situation because the Nikon bodies have a little bit more uh, complex metering system that can see faces and stuff. And just in my experience, something like a D810 or a D850 will often nail the exposure on a face, whereas my Canon equivalent bodies would require me to put that exposure compensation in manually. They both get the job done just fine, but you can see I can't just give everybody a single rule for these different situations because it does vary so much from camera to camera. Are you freaked out yet? Like this is a lot to handle, right? But the good news is this happens automatically after enough experience. I don't think through this entire process, my thumb just goes to the exposure compensation dial and adjust it and I just automatically review pictures and make adjustments is not even a conscious process anymore. And again, if you aren't at that unconscious level yet, then just keep shooting and practicing in situations where it's not critical, where it's okay if you blow the shot. <laughs> uh, if for sports and stuff, I'm in shutter priority mode. Now, when my kid was smaller, like five, six, seven, I was usually at shutter priority one two fiftieth of a second and auto ISO and that would work out okay. She's gotten older and now she moves a little faster and I have to shoot a little faster shutter speed. So I might be at 1 3 20th or 1 500th. It kind of depends on how many megapixels the camera body has because higher megapixel bodies will show motion blur more uh, and how far away they are because of course if they're closer you're going to see more motion too. Now if you want to pick out the right shutter speed for whatever situation you're shooting it's a matter of shoot, review, adjust. So you start at 1 250th, take a, take a picture and check, zoom in one to one and check the amount of motion blur. Look at a few different pictures. I like to have a little bit of motion blur. Some people like to freeze it, but a little bit of motion blur will help your camera use a lower ISO, which will give you cleaner images. And it also, to me, adds something to a sports image. It shows more of the movement and emotion and that I really like. Now, if you have too much motion blur, 
use a faster shutter speed, maybe jump up to 1 320th or 1 500th. If, if everything's completely frozen and you want to see a little more motion blur, slow it down. Go down to 1 1 60th. If I'm shooting, say, high school sports or college sports, uh, pro sports, I'm going to be faster. It might be at 1 1 1,000th of a second or maybe even 1 2,000th of a second. If I'm close and the action is really, really fast, I can't say I ever really find a situation where I need to go faster than 1 2,000th of a second, but it's very personal, just depending on how much uh, movement that you actually want to show in the image. And again, I err on the side of showing some movement. Again, just like before, I'm in auto ISO here, but I'm thinking about my exposure compensation. If I'm shooting players and they're kind of lit from the side by the sun, I don't want to blow those highlights out. So I'm looking closely at those highlights when I'm reviewing my pictures, and I might have to dial in some negative exposure compensation. If it's an overcast day, the picture could be washed out and the histogram might be all in the middle. In that case, I'll add a stop of exposure compensation, and, and part of that has become automatic for me, but I still like to review the pictures, look for blinkies, and make sure that my exposure is okay. Wildlife. For big flying birds like ospreys and eagles, I'm usually at one two thousandths of a second. That's pretty fast. Again, it kind of depends on the body. With higher resolution bodies, I tend to have to go higher. So I might be at 1 hundredth of a second or 1 thousandths of a second, especially as they get closer, I wanna go faster and faster. If it's say an egret in the water trying to catch a fish, when they're still, I might wanna shoot it at 1 250th of a second, but that moment when they go and grab a fish, I wanna freeze the water, I wanna freeze the fish, and I found that they're moving very, very fast. So I need to be at like 1 thousandths or 1 thousandths of a second. For smaller flying birds like songbirds, I need to be at at least one four thousandths of a second because they just flap much faster than bigger birds do. And for things like hummingbirds, really, really fast, I'm gonna be at one eight thousandths of a second. For flying birds, the sky is always going to be your background. So on overcast days, the sky is just gonna be white and that's gonna throw off the camera's ex uh, auto exposure system. So on overcast days, flying birds, I usually have to add a stop of exposure compensation. Again, with the 5DSR, it might be a stop and a half, uh, but I need to watch that really carefully. If it's a white bird, then I might I have to review the pictures and make sure I'm not overexposing the bird. If it's a, say, an egret that's against water, water tends to be very dark, depends on how the light is reflecting, but sometimes an egret next to the water, the egret will be eight or 10 stops brighter than the water. And I don't wanna expose the egret, but the camera's metering system will see all that dark water and give me a really, uh, slow shutter speed, so I'll have to dial in sometimes two, negative two or negative three stops of exposure compensation, but I'm checking out the highlights on those white birds to make sure that they're not overexposed, because you can pull up shadows, but you can only recover blown out highlights so much. Now, the rules are different for perch birds, because they're holding still mostly, but birds are always like moving their head around, and they're on a branch usually, and the branch is moving up and down with the wind and such too, uh, but also you have some camera shake. So I'm trying to use the slowest shutter speed I can in order to get my ISO as low as possible. Usually perch birds are in the shade of the woods or the forest or whatever, so your ISO can get high and your pictures can be noisy. So I wanna use the slowest shutter speed I can. My process is I start in shutter priority, automatic ISO, 1 2 50th of a second, and I will take 10 shots. And if the bird's still there, then I will double the shutter speed. I'll go to 1 1 25th of a second, and I'll take 20 shots. And if the bird's still hanging around, I'll drop down to 1 60th of a second and I'll take 40 shots. And sometimes if I'm feeling really ambitious and the bird is still hanging around, I'll drop to 1 30th of a second and just take as many shots as I can. Now, that can end up being a lot of pictures of one bird, but you know, if it's a portfolio worthy picture, that is totally worth it. And digital pictures don't cost you anything. You don't have to nail it on one try, that's silly. I will import my pictures and then review them backwards. So I'll start at the slowest shutter speeds and look for that one picture that just happened to end up sharp. Maybe the branch was moving in the wind, but it was just at its apex and the bird just happened to pause and any camera shake I might have had was just momentarily frozen by the lens's image stabilization and that will be my shot. Sometimes that best shot ends up being at 1 30th of a second, and sometimes it ends up being at 1 60th or 1 1 25th. But with that process, you're pretty much guaranteed of getting one sharp shot, even if the bird takes off right away, uh, or even if conditions are bad. But when you do have the time to be leisurely, you're gonna get the cleanest possible picture. Now, for astrophotography, it gets a little more complex. Again, I'm in manual mode. I will start out, always the lens is wide open because you're just gathering as much light as you can, I'll have the ISO usually starting out at 1 3200th, 
and then the shutter speed at 1 30th of a second. It's taking pictures of stars, right? I'll take a picture and look at the histogram. I want the stars to be almost peaking, almost highlighted. And if they're not, then I will raise my ISO up to 1 6400th of a second, 1 12,800th. Um, it, it depends on the atmospheric conditions, where you are, how high you are in the atmosphere, uh, how humid it is, all this stuff you just pretty much have to shoot and test. Now shutter speed also really matters too. 30 seconds will often give me star trails. Sometimes 30 seconds is fine. It depends on my focal length, the direction I'm facing, and how many megapixels the camera has. Lower megapixel cameras will hide some of that the motion blur caused by the stars. If there's significant motion blur, I'll drop the shutter speed down to like 1 20th or 1 15th of a second. There are formulas you can use, but for me, it's always easier just to, I'm, just to take a couple of test shots and zoom in one to one and see how much motion blur there is and adjust from there. You know, I have to take a couple of test shots to nail the exposure anyway, so getting the exposure right and cutting out the motion blur are something I do in typically two to three minutes, taking three or four shots, and then I'm set. And then I can just keep shooting at those settings for the rest of the night. That's pretty much it. Again, I know that's a lot. Information overload is a real thing for photographers. How can you possibly memorize that? You're not gonna do it overnight. Some of you are gonna be really technically inclined and you're gonna be able to master that pretty quickly. For other people, I, it just might make it not fun. In which case, you should just keep having fun with it and use auto mode. I explain all of this in great detail in my book, Stunning Digital Photography. So check that out. Chapter four is dedicated to camera settings and then I go deeper into camera settings and the different chapters dedicated to portraits and landscapes and wildlife, night photography, all that is covered. They all require their own independent processes. I hope this helps. That's everything I know. If you have follow-up tips down below or other questions, add a comment and I'll do my best to answer it. Subscribe and give me a like too. Thank you. Bye.